Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, Russia's attacks on civilians intensify. Apartment buildings shelled, schools attack. His campaign is stalled. The war grinds to a dangerous stalemate with no clear end in sight. And the devastating impact on vulnerable children. Catastrophe, big catastrophe. The difficult goodbye for critically ill kids who must leave their fathers behind. Also tonight here in Canada, the big impact of the CP rail shutdown. But if it lasts, it would be a very big uh, issue indeed. A labor dispute grinds one of Canada's biggest rail companies to a halt. What it means for supply chains already stressed. An international mission to track climate change at the edge of the earth. This problem is way beyond the capability of any nation to address. What the so-called doomsday glacier can tell us about the planet's fate and the Canadian keeping watch. This is The National. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is now a slow and violent struggle, and the consequences are more and more devastating for civilians. In the besieged city of Mariupol, bomb shelters where residents had fled for safety have become targets. With food, water and medical supplies running out, thousands more are being evacuated from the city. And according to Russian state media, Vladimir Putin is giving Ukraine an ultimatum. Surrender the city by Monday. Something Ukrainian officials say is out of the question. And as the violence against civilians ramps up, NATO leaders are preparing to meet this week with big questions hanging over them. Like how far Putin will go and what the West is willing to do to try to stop him. Susan Orbison begins our coverage in Lviv tonight, where residents looked for solace in Sunday church services, taking stock of the violence that's gripped their country. Faces creased with worry, going into a fourth week of war, reflecting on the last brutal days with more to come. Drawing strength from their faith when all else around them is crumbling. Every Sunday, more come to Lviv from all over Ukraine, fleeing Russian missiles in the east. This Ukrainian Orthodox Church follows a Moscow bishop. The war has triggered a rift. The local priests couldn't speak with us, but a sign says the Lviv diocese condemns the war started by Russia. The church is a sanctuary. Tatyana Samsonova fled her home near Kyiv. Did you ever think that this would happen? No, never, she says. We thought we were brothers. Brothers won't beat brothers. It was shocking for us. Her eight-year-old daughter, Margarita, begins to cry. I want to go back home, she says. The UN now says 10 million Ukrainians are displaced out of their homes. Others are trapped mercilessly in Mariupol basements, abandoning the shells of once homes and bodies on the street. Ukraine says another Russian airstrike hit an art school. Maybe 400 people could be buried. In Kiev, more shelling near an apartment building. Russia claiming it launched two new hypersonic missiles targeting fuel and ammunition depots as President Zelensky raised the prospect of direct negotiations with President Putin. But if these attempts fail, that would mean that, that this is a third world war. A long war is still unthinkable. A month ago, Sunday was a peaceful pause. Now no one can predict their futures. Svetlana Suglob and her kids just got off the train from the Donbass. Anna, what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. I see that everything is very bad. Nothing stops. Nothing good will be there. She dreams she'll have her home to come back to. They are clinging now to the power of faith and resilience to endure this war. President Zelensky is putting stock in negotiations. It's time to talk, he said this weekend. But the U.S. is cautioning President Putin gives no indication he's giving way and that any talks may not result in any agreed compromise soon. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Lviv. Today, the U.S. Defense Secretary said he expects Russia to continue going after civilian targets in the days ahead.
I believe that he's uh, taking these kinds of steps because, as uh, was described earlier, his campaign is stalled. He's not been able to achieve the goals as rapidly that he wants to achieve as rapidly as he wants to achieve them. Prior to the art school that Susan mentioned, a theater in Mariupol was also hit, where hundreds of people were believed to be sheltering. Residential buildings have also been struck in Kyiv and other cities. In just a few days, NATO leaders will gather in Brussels to discuss Ukraine and the consequences for Russia. But as Travis Danraj explains, there's still one move that seems out of the question. Thursday's historic NATO meeting will demonstrate unity and Western military might. But despite the show of strength, the alliance is only willing to go so far. NATO will not be present uh, on the ground uh, and not send in uh, planes uh, in the Ukrainian airspace uh, because that will most likely trigger a full-fledged war between NATO and Russia. Now, new claims by Russia it has used hypersonic and cruise missiles to strike military facilities. Concern is increasing Putin could use chemical and nuclear weapons. What remains unclear? The response that would trigger from NATO. This would cross a threshold in the international community. It's dangerous and it would be a grave mistake if you were to use these weapons. After a series of impassioned speeches by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, including one to Israel's legislature Sunday, the West is increasing support. The U.S. is sending 800 million more in military aid. But on that key ask, a no-fly zone, no movement. Last week, the Polish, Czech and Slovenian prime ministers ventured into the war zone to meet Zelensky. To go there to, to really see how they feel, how, how, what they need and what the real, what the real situation is because uh, many times what we see on the screens is not actually what's happening on the ground. NATO's focus remains on reinforcing member nations' borders. A striker infantry company is on the way from the U.S. to bolster the alliance's eastern flank and a second Canadian warship left for the region. As more equipment heads across the Atlantic, discussions next week will also likely focus on defense spending. Canada falls far short of the agreed-upon target of 2% of GDP. That could soon change come next month's budget. Possible off-ramps for Putin may also be discussed next week. One option, a pledge Ukraine will never join NATO, something the Kremlin could view as a win. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. The war has been especially devastating for children battling critical illnesses like cancer. Their treatments have been interrupted and many are now being moved out of Ukraine to hospitals around the world. David Common met with some of the children and their families in Lviv as they began a difficult journey. Life has been cruel to Olga Lazanska, and today it gets worse. You can see the fear in her eyes, and so can her father. <laughs> Olga has brain cancer, and the war prevents Ukrainian hospitals from helping her anymore. She's being moved to Poland. But that escape to safety won't include her father. He can't leave Ukraine. No one knows when or if they'll see each other again. 40 patients are being moved out of Lviv's Children's Hospital, some by ambulance, others in buses. Children who found refuge here from across the country. But the last safe place isn't safe anymore. Pediatric surgeon Andrei Kuzik just couldn't imagine this would happen. No, no. Nobody and nowhere. I, I don't believe that 21st century such Russia uh, start war. <laughs> it's impossible. But catastrophe, big catastrophe. All the young patients head first to Poland for triage, then to hospitals worldwide, some to sick kids in Toronto. <laughs> Natalia Moskva tells us about the tumor on her six-year-old daughter Diana's spine. She too must leave her husband and home behind. Double trouble, she tells us, worrying about your country and your child. Oksana Melnyuk says a recent missile attack here in Lviv has made her decision easier. Same for her daughter, 18-year-old Nastya, who also has cancer. All my friends have already left Ukraine, she says. This may seem like the obvious choice. Parents everywhere want to protect their children. 
But there are consequences. Splitting apart families, leaving home in an ambulance. Unsure if you'll ever return. David Coleman, CBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. Now to news in Canada where supply chains have been dealt another blow. Canadian Pacific, one of the country's two big freight railways, ground to a halt around midnight Sunday. Six months of negotiations couldn't resolve its dispute with 3,000 workers. Marina von Stackelberg shows us what's at stake for industries already reeling. <laughs> CP's engineers, conductors and yard workers are walking a picket line over more than two dozen unsettled contract issues like wages, working conditions, benefits and pensions. Uh, all throughout the pandemic, we've been slugging it out in the trenches, um, keeping supply lines going, uh, working in uh, you know, a challenging work environment. Um, we, we do feel for the customers and the, and, the, uh, and the country. The union and the company are blaming each other for the shutdown. Teamsters Canada Rail Conference says the railway locked out workers overnight. CP says it didn't do that, but that employees walked off the job. We've been bargaining in good faith to avoid this kind of disruption and bring any of this uncertainty to an end. Without an end soon, the shipment of commodities like grain, lumber and oil will remain stalled. Industry groups and farmers say Ottawa has to act now to get the trains rolling again. The sheer volume of freight that's not moving will pile up quickly and at great expense. But Canada's Labour Minister gave no sign that back-to-work legislation is being considered. I am singularly focused on that table and the people at it and getting a deal so that, uh, so that there's, we can at least have some degree of uh, normality uh, in the Canadian economy. Farmer Chuck Fossey is worried. His bin is full of grain that is supposed to be sent out on a CP train. Many farmers are very stressed out because of the poor crops they had last year. And now they're just being stressed one more time. Now this year's crops are also in jeopardy. Many farmers are relying on shipments of fertilizer in the coming weeks. Three quarters of it comes by rail. If it's all over and done with within 10 days, then it's more of a hiccup than a panic. Uh, but if it lasts and carries on for weeks on end, oh, it would be a very big uh, issue indeed. Marina, you're out of one of the picket lines tonight and describe for us some more about the concerns if this isn't settled. Well, that supply chain expert I spoke to says he thinks the federal government will step in if things drag on. Now, industry leaders and farmers say this is the worst possible time for a labor dispute. We are still reeling from the pandemic, droughts and floods. And now, of course, supply chain issues, the skyrocketing price of gas and inflation that is really record setting. Now, there are also concerns that this situation could further hurt Canada's reputation as a reliable supplier of goods to the world. Ian. Marina von Stackelberg in Winnipeg. Thank you. More Canadian provinces, including the biggest one, are set to remove mask mandates this week. But could that be short-lived? Farah Morali shows us who's worried about a surge in cases, even as others welcome the return of a celebration that's all about luck. In downtown Toronto, crowds line the streets to take in a now novel sight, a real-life parade. Happy St. Patrick's Day! The St. Patrick's Day parade was one of the first big events quashed by COVID here. It's now the first large-scale in-person event to bounce back. We heard a parade on the news. Are you excited? Yeah. Many signed up for a front row seat. They've missed so much in the last two years, and so with the pandemic and everything, it's just been, we've been isolating a lot and not being able to enjoy, so we got ourselves out today with our chairs, and we're excited to be here. Things are opening up again. We're excited to start getting back outside and going to things like this. Yeah. Hey, it all signals a return to a sense of normalcy. On Monday, Ontario and Nova Scotia will join most other provinces in lifting mask mandates, even though that comes with risks. You should prepare yourself for a surge in infections. Cases have been spiking again in Europe, where restrictions have already loosened, a trend expected to play out in Canada. There's also concern about the severity of future variants if the virus keeps spreading. It's a tricky balance, but right now probably is the time to be opening up, going into spring and summer, and giving people a break from the strong kind of measures to try to restrict spread. This, this stuff is called Guinness. A break is what many businesses are looking for. After months of tap dancing through pandemic restrictions and closures. 
It really was a very tough two years for everybody. Inside this bar, a sense of optimism that whatever lies ahead can be managed. It's looking as if the death rates are coming down. So if people get sick or well, we can cope with it, I think we have to go full steam ahead, keep the economy going. And to keep celebrations like this possible. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. A 24-year-old man faces multiple charges after a mosque in Mississauga, Ontario, was attacked early Saturday morning. When, when we were praying, he walked in with uh, a, a, in one hand, you know, the bear spray with the canister of the bear spray and the other hand, uh, the, he had an ax. The thing that rushed to my, my, to my mind at that time is that, uh, oh, does this guy have a gun? Some of the 20 congregants who were there confronted the attacker, knocked that hatchet from his hand and subdued him until police arrived. Police say they believe the incident was motivated by hate. Mohammed Mozamar faces six charges, including assault with a weapon. Now to a CBC Go Public investigation. As many companies look to diversify their workforce, a Winnipeg woman wants them to think about how they do that. The Indigenous woman was applying for a job at CIBC but stopped after two questions left her stunned. Caroline Bargut has her story. Like many 21-year-olds, Christine Paquette is trying to figure out what to do with her life. While scrolling on a job website, she came across an ad specifically for Indigenous applicants interested in customer service jobs at CIBC. She decided to apply. The first question I saw was, um, it said along the lines, please explain like your favorite tradition or your favorite story. And I was like, huh, that's a little odd thing to be asking. She kept going until she saw this. It was suggested Indigenous applicants produce a video cover letter to let their personality shine. And the posting said they could dress in traditional regalia. Now I want you to prove to me how Indigenous you are and throw on your powwow dress and powwow it up for me. <laughs> That's how I took it. Paquette wasn't impressed and tweeted at CIBC. CIBC responded saying they work with an Indigenous organization called Our Children's Medicine and that the questions were designed in consultation with Indigenous community leaders and elders. Go Public contacted Our Children's Medicine. They said their intention was to craft questions that would help managers identify lived, cultural and transferable skills that get lost during the traditional corporate application and interview process. This Indigenous HR expert says they missed the mark. Regalia isn't just traditional clothing. What it is, is it's a right to wear that clothing. And it's a responsibility on how, how you use that, that clothing. The question about regalia is no longer part of the questions on the application. OCM says it appreciates the feedback and would like to meet with Paquette to discuss her concerns. I love the idea of putting those positions aside and to diversify their workplace and that's great but in doing so you have to make sure you're being respectful to the people you're employing and to the people you're asking to come work for you. She says the only thing they need to ask is if an applicant is First Nations, Métis or Inuit. The rest, she says, should be left to the job seeker to share if they choose. Caroline Bargood, CBC News, Winnipeg. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. As inflation soars, businesses are under pressure to raise prices. $5.99, two weeks ago, $3.99. Coming up, the challenges facing one restaurant trying to stay affordable, plus. I'm standing on an ice shelf, which has the Pacific Ocean underneath it. I speak with a Canadian scientist near the Doomsday Glacier in Antarctica, aptly named for its possible collapse. It seems to be unrolling right now. But first, the celebrity divorce shining a light on harassment and abuse. If a literal billionaire can't escape her abusive, toxic, problematic ex, then how do people expect the rest of us to do so? We're back after this. In front of a sold-out London crowd this weekend, performers took to the stage to raise money for people who have fled their homes in Ukraine. The charity gala was organized by two former Royal Ballet stars from Ukraine and Romania. 
It included artists from Argentina, Brazil, the UK, the US, France, Japan, Ukraine, and Russia. Just one example of people all over the world rallying to help Ukrainians, sending whatever support they can. And that includes a group in Latvia that's collecting and driving vehicles into the war zone to help in the fight against Russia. As Barry Stewart explains, they see it as helping their own security as well. The final instructions before a 15-hour drive across three countries. This journey is about a delivery. 17 cars are headed from Latvia to Ukraine for the country's territorial defense units. This one is going, Nissan Navara, Ford Ranger is going. Martin Danita says all of these cars have either been donated or purchased by his garage at a deep discount. If you call, uh, call people who are selling 4x4 vehicles and you say, OK, but that's for Ukraine, so what can you do? And they say, OK, let's go, let's go for half a price. So everyone is so supportive. Dozens of vehicles have already been delivered to Ukraine near the front line. Slava Ukraini! Where roads are rough and vehicles can easily be damaged. Before they hit the road, a team of mechanics makes sure they're good to go. And valuable cargo, including gas, is loaded up. In addition to all of the cars that are being taken to Ukraine, people are coming to drop off donations to send as well. In this car, someone has brought sleeping bags, power banks to charge phones and clothing. Some not only donate their cars, but volunteer to drive them as well. Thinking also about our, our own security and, 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 and our, our society as well. So I think, yes, of course, I need to help. And that fear is at the root of most of the volunteer effort. On this trip, a few Latvians are hitching a ride on the convoy so they can join the fight in Ukraine. Everyone knows that we are next. So, so it's as simple as that. If Russia is stopped in Ukraine, then they don't come here. As easy as that. You really believe that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Which is why those heading down say these cars and this trip are the least they can do because this is not just about Ukraine. Briar Stewart, CBC News, near Riga, Latvia. Pope Francis once again spoke out against the violence in Ukraine today, calling it a senseless massacre. Tutto questo è disumano, anzi, è anche sacrilego, perché va contro la sacralità della vita umana. He went on to say there's no justification for the war, but stopped short of calling out Russia by name. Saturday, Francis visited a hospital in Rome where children wounded in Ukraine are being treated. In Belgium today, at least six people were killed in a small town after a vehicle rammed into a crowd at high speed. Another 10 people received life-threatening injuries. They had been gathering since dawn for an annual carnival that's popular in the region. Two local men were arrested. Prosecutors said the attack does not seem to be terror-related. The Grammys have banned nominee Kanye West from performing, reportedly over his concerning online conduct towards his ex, Kim Kardashian. It has been escalating for weeks very publicly and largely unchecked. As Katie Simpson explains, for some, the rhetoric has moved beyond celebrity gossip to a real concern about domestic abuse. And then somehow I'm the one that's the stalker. For well, all of the public to see, to Kanye West has been using children. social media to target his ex, Kim Kardashian. It has mostly been framed as tabloid fodder, nothing more than publicity craving celebrities going through a divorce. That changed this week, following a conversation on late night TV. You may not feel sorry for Kim, you know, because she's rich and famous, or whatever, you hate her, whatever. But, but, what she's going through is terrifying to watch and it shines a spotlight on what so many women go through when they choose to leave. You know, people always... Trevor Noah is a family violence survivor and dedicated 10 minutes of his show to what he sees as concerning behavior. I'm a dad. I have an opinion. I'm an American. I'm a Christian. West has aggressively used social media to try to convince Kardashian to reconsider their divorce, while also attacking her reputation, her new boyfriend, Pete Davidson, repeatedly ignoring their pleas to stop. If a literal billionaire can't escape her abusive, toxic, problematic, whatever word you want to use, ex, 
then how do people expect the rest of us to do so? West, who is known to live with mental health challenges, responded to Noah with a racial slur on Instagram. He was suspended from the app and shortly after, his performance at the Grammys was cancelled. While no charges have been laid, the head of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence says this is abusive. Um, because Kim is who she is, because we're human, we go, well, you know, it's probably what she had coming. She's not sympathetic. She's never supported women's issues, blah, blah, blah. Well, I would say to all of us, we should not care about that in this instance. Kardashian's experience is unfortunately common when women leave relationships. What is unique is her enormous platform and whether she decides to use it to start a conversation of her own. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Next on The National, scientists are worried what will happen when a massive glacier comes apart. All the things you might expect to happen if it was collapsing seem to be happening. My conversation with the Canadian scientist who got a close-up view of the so-called Doomsday Glacier. Welcome back. An international team of scientists recently returned home from a critical mission in the most remote place on this planet. The Thwaites Glacier in western Antarctica has been described as the Doomsday Glacier. Massive and unstable, its fate is tied to ours. Should climate change cause it to fail, sea levels could rise dramatically. And it already appears to be happening. Here's a satellite image of it in 2001. And then less than two decades later, in 2019. Canadian scientist David Holland was part of that challenging month-long mission to track the ice in western Antarctica to determine if and when the glacier could slip into the sea. I managed to connect with him in Antarctica just before he left. Well, David, it is extraordinary to be talking to you while you are in Antarctica. Describe for me exactly where you are and what we can see behind you. Okay, so I'm um, in west Antarctica. I'm on an ice shelf adjacent to Thwaites Glacier, where I was trying to go a month ago, about 50 nautical miles that way. Instead, I'm on the Dotson ice shelf. We've been here now uh, over a month. Uh, we're decamping exactly at this moment. All the Canadian helicopters are airlifting all of our equipment back to the icebreaker. It's, as you can see, it's a beautiful day. You can see all the guys in the background moving stuff out. So this is moving day and um, Last night, the sun set for the first time. It's usually up 24 hours, but last night, the sun set. It's starting to get cold. <laughs> and you had hoped to get to, to Thwaites. Uh, did the weather get in the way? Why weren't you able to, to go there? Uh, a month or so ago on the Korean icebreaker, we tried to cut through the sea ice, which was very heavy this year. We tried for a few days, and we could not make it to Thwaites Glacier. Uh, then there are these very large icebergs that have collected sea ice around it. So nobody could get to Thwaites by ship this year. Um, incidentally, last night, I did take a three-hour helicopter ride over to Thwaites that way, and we put in some temperature probes through cracks in the glacier, uh, hoping in the future we can all get back there and do our science. I, I feel like it just goes without saying, if you're a scientist in Antarctica, you have to be able to adjust on the fly, which you have. Uh, what have you been able to gather in terms of data over the last three weeks or so? We pulled up here on this ice shelf, the Dotson, and we drilled through 500 meters. Behind me, you might see some tower structures. We drilled through 500 meters of the ice. I'm standing on an ice shelf, which has the Pacific Ocean underneath it. And we measured very warm temperatures underneath that ice shelf. And it's causing this whole ice shelf area and Thwaites, the elevation to drop substantially several meters every year, one of the largest changes on the planet. And it's happening because warm water from the Pacific Ocean is coming underneath this part of Antarctica, which is quite remarkable. Which, of course, sounds dire and the impact it would have if, I guess, all of that ice suddenly crashed into the ocean. How dire is it? The long-term forecast is not great. All of this part of West Antarctica, uh, as our planet warms, ice probably melts is a likely outcome. It melts in a way that we're learning about how the air temperature changes, winds changes, ocean currents, and those ocean currents go underneath Antarctica and 
bring it down. So will that happen for certain? We're not sure. It's very plausible. It seems to be unrolling right now as we look from space with satellites and we put instruments underneath. All the things you might expect to happen if it was collapsing seem to be happening. And incidentally, in the background is South Pole. Uh, right now, all of these glaciers are on a seafloor high and once they go melt past that, there's no more pinning points until you reach the south pole of the planet. So it's it might be unstoppable if it happens. And, and, and are we talking about years or decades or longer? I think we're talking decades to centuries. Um, one of the things is we've seen in the past, thousands of years ago, sea level rise by several meters in a century. So we know these kind of events happen. They've happened in the past. Uh, sea level naturally changes by almost 100 meters on the planet between ice ages. Most of the time, Canada is under an enormous ice sheet and sea level is almost like 100 meters lower. So there are these natural fluctuations in sea level. And then there are these ones that are happening here now, which are partly natural. But we've also been running computer models and finding out that the way the currents are changing is due to a wind change, which ultimately has a greenhouse gas impact or influence. Now, I think uh, behind you on your left side is a Canadian helicopter. Um, and, and, and this is, a, I guess, an international uh, research project that's going on. That's right. So the, um, we have the Korean icebreaker, Arion, as our lead, and they brought us south. We, the drillers, we have the best ice drillers in the world from the United Kingdom, the British Antarctic Survey. We have support from the National Science Foundation of the USA, and we have absolutely amazing pilots from Canada. That's John Bishop over there from Vancouver. And um, it's just amazing what, as a team, we've been able to achieve with some good hard work and some very good luck. And it, this problem is way beyond the capability of any nation to address. So over the coming years, it's going to require a very large international effort to ultimately arrive at a forecast for society to say what might happen and when, because we're talking about potentially from here, Thwaites, up to a meter, but with the neighbors, several meters. Ultimately, Antarctica, up to 10 meters of global sea level change over decades to centuries, which would basically rewrite our global coastline. You're decamping today, as you said, in other words, getting ready to leave. Your home in Newfoundland is a long ways away. When, when are you gonna get back there? On March 10th, I arrived back in Newfoundland. I live in a beautiful village, Brigus, Newfoundland, where my wife and I will retire. And I'm really looking forward to that. Antarctic has been fine, but it's, as I said, the sun set last night. An old Antarctic proverb, when the sun sets, time to head north, which is very true. So we've had a, a great time here. We've made some significant measurements of a scientific nature. We're all very excited about what we achieved. We've had many, many failures this year, to say the least. Um, but if hopefully we can get the team back together and back here in a couple of years. Well, Skype worked for us, and it's fascinating to be able to talk to you while you're in Antarctica, David. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. After we did that interview, big news kept getting in the way. I'm glad we were able to find time for it tonight. After the break, the fallout of rising inflation. We've tried to keep our prices uh, as low as we possibly can. And it's getting every day, every month, it's getting a, a lot more difficult. A Toronto restaurant struggles to stay affordable. Plus... None of us really have any expectation of actually owning a home. The realities for students facing growing tuition fees. Last week, the inflation rate surged to a 30-year high. With soaring food prices and a spike in the cost of fuel, many Canadians are finding it increasingly tough to make ends meet. We're taking a closer look at how people are coping as part of our series, Priced Out. Tonight, Nick Purden takes us to a family restaurant in Toronto and shows us why the owner is determined to keep his prices low. Can I get a two chicken on a pizza? Two? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Everybody deserves to feel comfortable going somewhere and being able to afford a meal. We don't want to cater to a certain type of person or people. We want to have all walks of life come in here. Jim Serbos has always made it his mission 
to keep prices affordable at his Toronto restaurant. The prices of food and everything in general, all goods, have gone up tremendously and we've tried to keep our prices uh, as low as we possibly can. And it's getting every day, every month, it's getting a, a lot more difficult. For Jim to raise his prices is a last resort. He's only done it once in the last five years. But with the pandemic, supply chain issues, and inflation pushing food prices up and up, can his restaurant survive? I mean, this, this place means it's, it's my life, right? To understand what exactly Jim's up against, I've come here to Toronto's St. Lawrence Market, one of the oldest in the city. You see that grape? It's $5.99 a pound. That used to be $3.99 a pound. It almost cost you more than a glass of wine. You might as well get the wine and get buzzed on it. Tell me about it. We haven't seen food prices go up like this in a long time in Canada. $5.99. Two weeks ago, $3.99. Mario Ricci's problem is he can't pass the higher costs that he has to pay onto his customers. I owe you a dollar. Okay, come on. Okay, so it's two fifty. He tells me people are already buying less because food prices have gone up so much. Hello. How are you, my friend? Surviving. Basically, I'm living on my savings right now because we can't make any money selling vegetables when the vegetable prices are so high. You know, nothing, zero. What do you want? Mario has owned this business most of his life, and he's seen hard times before. He even survived throat cancer and kept working. This is the toughest time I've seen in 36 years I've owned this store. It's hard to stay in business because the higher the prices go, the less money we make in the pocket. That's saying a lot from one of the veterans in the St. Lawrence market. Think about it. If Mario can't make it selling something we all have to buy, how can Jim Serbos make it, keeping his prices so low at his Square Boy restaurant? Jim tells me that their philosophy, ever since his dad bought the place when he came to Canada from Greece, has been to make the restaurant affordable for everyone. I've been brought off. I was brought off from my parents just to treat people with respect, be fair with everyone. Right? This is more than just a restaurant for a lot of people, and it's more than just a restaurant for me. It's important that everyone can afford to buy food and not feel judged. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, a melting pot for, for people, especially in this neighborhood. And like, we want to stay true to that. Spend some time here for lunch and you see it. You know, I'm working in a cold and I want to have a hot meal, right? So it's good to be here and have, get a good meal for, you know, for what we got to do hard labor, get, you know, keep us going, <laughs> get the energy. Chad Mount Pleasant is a welder. He has three daughters. And he tells me that times are hard. My situation, uh, just keep working. You know, I try to stay positive on everything that's going on and, and um, just do the best I can to feed my family, you know. Come to Toronto and work hard and you know, we've got a good place like this, feeding everybody, all the workers and whatnot. So the value of the food here too is good. And, you know, yeah, I do save some money here. You know. To keep his prices affordable, Jim has to keep his margins low. And he pays as little as possible for supplies. It's been ongoing conversations with distributors that we've had long-term relationships with and their understanding to what we're doing. I mean, they, they come in here and tell us often that we should raise prices. Um, but it's hard for them to justify raising prices on us when they see our price point. So it's not like we're, we, we're battling with them to keep their prices low so we can profit more. A meal here is half the price of most comparable restaurants in the city. And Jim wants to keep it that way because he knows what people are going through, especially now. How are you? I think money is really tough to come by nowadays. Uh, people work really hard. Uh, wages have, you know, stayed the same for a long time. And you can here buy, buy a, a meal for four people for under $25, right? I think that's unheard of, right? And it's, it's a good way to kind of escape reality of what's happening right now. Thank you very much. It's when I meet Tina Novello that I understand how important this place can be for people. Right now, there's, you know, um, 
The prices of food have gone crazy. I'm a single mother, so when I go into grocery store, it gives me a bit of anxiety these days. You know, you look at the meat counter and it's like, wow, what can I afford today? And that's why Tina comes here, because the prices don't change. It feels like prices from 20 years ago. You know what I mean? These days, you go for a burger and it's, you know, $10, $12. Well, here you can get a, a banquet burger for 6 bucks. I'm usually buying for me and my son, and I just find that I don't feel guilty about spending, you know, 20 bucks for a meal for the two of us. To me, this is a very affordable treat. Thank you, sir. For Jim, to sell an affordable meal to people like Tina and her son is his goal. And he's able to keep doing it, he says, because of his priorities. It's about happiness in life, right? Life isn't all about money. It's not about nice cars and big houses. Life is about being accepted by your peers, being accepted by your community, and, uh, and just being nice to one another, which we're, we're really lacking now in today's day and age. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. Another climbing expense is tuition. Deanna Sumanag Johnson now with a struggle to keep up when you're on a student budget. Dane Monkman says he's luckier than most. The tuition for his graduate program is up to $8,000 a year, funded by his band, the Pegwis First Nation. Even with a part-time job, it's still difficult to make ends meet. We're usually going to buy in bulk from places like Costco. Um, getting meals prepared for the full week at a time uh, and even, you know, trying not to go out and spend anything at all on uh, sort of entertainment purposes. In other cities, rent is so high, some students like Yasmin Gardi have to turn to food banks for help. And I live in a one bedroom apartment and my rent is 1700 per month. On top of living expenses, tuition costs are set to rise again this year for both domestic and international students, and those from abroad are limited in how much they can work in Canada. So I'm maintaining my, my schedule at only 20 hours a week. It's not enough to maintain yourself. Um, it's you said it's, not a, it's at a fast food place? Yeah, it's at a fast food place, um, so I'm getting paid minimum wage. Okay. Tuition for this New Yorker attending college in Canada, close to $20,000 a year for courses that are all online. Rent for his shared basement apartment, additional $12,000 a year. Nowadays, most people my generation that I speak to, none of us really have any expectation of actually owning a home. That's one of the reasons Dane Monkman is working with Canadian Federation of Students to lobby for a freeze on tuition increases, more scholarships and bursaries, or to forgive student loans. That sort of debt that hangs over students or becomes a barrier for entry for students is really hard to deal with and certainly keeps some students out completely. So that he, the first generation of his family to attend university, isn't the last. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Most of us have a favorite band or artist, but how many of us can say we've seen them live 30 times and counting? I just can't get enough of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> One man's devotion that sees no bounds. Next. This summer, the Rolling Stones are embarking on their 60th anniversary tour across Europe. That's right, 60 years of the Stones. Edmonton's Donovan Workin has been rocking out to them for much of that time. He's attended 30 concerts, and he's not done. He's actually headed to Europe for another, and perhaps another. His Stones addiction is our moment. I'm not like a fanatic crazy fan, but I'm, uh, I'm up there. So when I was 13, unfortunately, my brother passed away. He was a little bit older than me, but I inherited all of his records. Tucked away in there, there were the first pressing of Sticky Fingers. I put that on, and it seemed weird because some of the songs I felt like I knew. Talking to my sister, she's like, oh, yeah, when that album came out in 71, we played it so much, and you would dance around as a little kid. So the Rolling Stones are, you know, the soundtrack of my life. I live in Edmonton, so when I go see the Rolling Stones, there are no other options but to hop on a plane and fly somewhere. I've seen them all over North America, Seattle, Los Angeles, Anaheim, Atlanta, New York, Toronto, the list goes on. I've got a 
few jackets, lots and lots of t-shirts. I uh, managed to get one of 800 production Rolling Stones pinball machines that was put out in 1982. I got a problem. Uh, yeah, I think I got a problem. I just can't get enough of the Rolling Stones. You see, even in the space of 30 seconds, he started off by suggesting he didn't have a problem, but then when he started listing things, he realized he did. His first concert in 1989, he was 19 years old, needed his mother to co-sign a loan so he could afford it. And he's been in a Stones concert movie, an IMAX movie, because in Wembley Stadium in 1990, he was in the front row. That's The National for March 20th. Good night.